thinking about something that happened on Wednesday morning. I was taking a walk with Frank, my dog, and as we came around the corner, I saw a woman um, who was lying on the ground. And it looked like she might be having a seizure. And so I, I ran over, and I, as I got closer, I realized that she had hit her head on a big concrete flower planter that was on the corner. I didn't have my phone on me, so I began to, to call out in the early morning to another person who was walking on the sidewalk. And he began to call 911. And then thankfully, another car stopped and a man jumped out and came over and explained that he was a retired army medic. And he began to kind of give her some, some very initial care. All three of us waited with her until the ambulance arrived. She regained consciousness and she was able to even talk with us a little bit. She was really scared, didn't know what had happened, but she was able to tell us her name. We made sure that she was in safe hands and that all of her belongings that had fallen on the ground like, made it in to the ambulance with her. And as the paramedics were beginning to tend to her, I thanked both of the other strangers who had stopped. And the medic said, oh, of course. And then he sort of kind of cocked his head and shrugged his shoulders and he looked at me and he said, I feel like not many people stop these days. I can't stop thinking about what happened partly because I have been thinking about this woman. I hope that she's doing okay. She's been in my daily prayers every single morning. And partly, I can't stop thinking about it because of what that medic said to me. I feel like not many people stop these days. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if it's entirely true, although maybe I'm being a little too hopeful. <laughs> I feel like most people would stop if they see someone having a seizure or a medical emergency. I, I really feel like that's the case. But as I thought about it, I did recognize that there are many things for which people don't stop. I think about the tent city near my apartment, or about the individuals who ask for assistance at the exits of Lakeshore Drive. I think of all the cars that pass day after day after day, and I think about the fact that honestly, I'm sometimes one of the people in those cars. And sometimes I stop, but sometimes I don't. Jeremiah 29, 7, one of my favorite verses says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. This verse emphasizes the essential truth that our welfare is tied up with the welfare of others. As Dr. King put it, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. My well-being and your well-being are not separate, discrete, contained entities, 
My well-being depends on the well-being of the woman who fell on the street, depends upon the medic who came to help, depends upon the people in Tent City, depends upon every person who does or does not stop. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. It's an essential truth. But Jeremiah is speaking it in a quite unexpected place in this passage. Jeremiah is speaking to the Jewish people in exile. We've talked a bit about exile in recent weeks. The Jewish people in this passage, they've been uprooted from Jerusalem, uprooted from everything that they know, and they're displaced in Babylon. So this is likely a people who do not want the welfare of Babylon, the welfare of that city, at all. And that's understandable. Now, Jeremiah is not the only prophet who's speaking to the people at this time. There's another prophet named Hananiah. And Hananiah is preaching a very different message. Hananiah tells the people to cheer up. Cheer up. This is all going to be over soon. We're going to be back home before you know it in no time at all. Hananiah is preaching a really appealing message. It's exactly what they want to hear. But it isn't true. They're going to be in Babylon for decades, for 70 years. Hananiah is preaching what one might call toxic positivity. Has anyone ever heard that term, toxic positivity? Toxic positivity dismisses all the negative, and it gives false reassurances in the face of a painful situation. You might have experienced toxic positivity if you tell someone about something hard that you're going through, and they say, well, you should really not focus on that and look on the bright side. It doesn't always feel very good. Toxic positivity wants everyone to be happy, even at the cost of ignoring someone's pain or not dealing with any problems, sweeping things under the rug. Jeremiah, on the other hand, is preaching what we could call tragic optimism. Tragic optimism maintains hope while acknowledging the real pain and difficulty. Tragic optimism, according to psychologist Viktor Frankl, finds meaning despite the inevitable pain, inevitable pain and loss of human life. Jeremiah, with this tragic optimism, says, yes, this is difficult. Yes. This is not what we want. Yes, I want to go back too. But build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Get married and have children. Put down roots. Jeremiah says, build a life here. Build a life here as impossible and unacceptable as that may seem. Why? <laughs> I mean, why? Why bother? Why not just wait it out? It's going to be over eventually, right? If we just sit tight, hold on, then things will eventually get back to the way that they were. Well, I think Jeremiah bothers because this time matters. This 70 years, it, it matters. This time of exile still has meaning. There's life to be lived. There's good work to be done. And God is still present. God didn't stay behind in Jerusalem. God is in Babylon, too. You see, Jeremiah's message it offers a paradigm shift. God is not just for one group. God is not just invested in the welfare of one particular people. God is universal. 
God wants the well-being of the Jewish people, and God wants the welfare of their perceived enemies in Babylon. God wants the welfare of the entire city and all of its people. Jesus understands this well. Our gospel text today tells us a healing story. Now, many of you have probably heard this story before. It's a common one. And oftentimes, when we read this particular text, we focus the lesson on gratitude. Jesus is entering a village and encounters a group of lepers. They come to him calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus tells all ten to go to go show themselves to a priest. And as they journey there, all of them are healed. Most of them continue on their way, but one, one individual, a Samaritan no less, returns to say thank you. We typically focus on that thank you, and it's an important lesson. It teaches us about the interconnections between faith and gratitude. This is central to our tradition. In fact, the word used here in the Greek for thankfulness, for the gratitude that that individual shows, the word is Euchariston. Euchariston, Eucharist. Communion, the Lord's Supper, the root. It's right here in this gospel text. The root is gratitude. That's important. But I want us to notice something else today. I want us to notice that all ten are healed. Leprosy was a wide category in this time. It could refer to any number of diseases, ailments, and disabilities. And those who were put into this category of leprosy, they had to live in groups outside of villages and cities. They were also exiled. They had to uproot themselves from everything that they knew from their families, their communities. They had to live apart. This was a marginalized people. And Jesus heals all ten. He heals all ten without qualification. He heals all of them without questioning their religion, ethnicity, politics, or even their level of gratitude. Yes, there's an important lesson on gratitude here. The one comes back and says, thank you, but all ten are healed. Gratitude, too, is not a prerequisite for Jesus' healing. Jesus understands that the welfare of the city is tied up with the welfare of its most marginalized. Jesus has no prerequisites for healing because he wants all people to be well. He understands that all people deserve that full stop. What if we approached our own city this way? What if we didn't create any prerequisites to care and to welfare? What if we truly understood, I mean truly, truly understood that our welfare is caught up in the welfare of others, especially the most marginalized? And what if we lived in a way that showed that our welfare is caught up with the welfare of the most marginalized? What if we really believed that our welfare was tied up with their welfare, was tied up with the welfare of every single person whether or not they choose to stop. Our city, speaking of Chicago, our city is not well. It's a city I love, but it's not well. It's not well when more than 65,000 people are experiencing homelessness, 25% of whom are children. Just this morning, before worship, I had a conversation with someone who's losing their housing in four days and has nowhere to go. That's not well. Our city is not well, not when 523 people have been killed by gun violence this year. Our city is not well, not when at minimum, I think this is an undercount, minimum 16% of households, 33% in Hyde Park, are food insecure. And let me tell you, 
And some of you might know this from your own experience. It's not easy to get care. It's not easy to get assistance. There are so many prerequisites, so many prerequisites to getting care, to getting housing or food or medical care or economic assistance. If you volunteered at our food pantry, we don't ask a lot of the questions that these forms tell us to ask. If we asked all of the questions, we would have to ask people their age, their gender identity, their race, their economic status, what their job is, how many children they have, who else lives in their household, whether they receive any number of additional benefits and assistance where they live. Can you imagine going to the grocery store? Going to the grocery store, you want to pick up some apples and a box of mac and cheese. And someone, before you can check out, asks you all of those questions. Can you imagine how that would feel? How invasive that would feel? What if we didn't put prerequisites to getting care? Our city is not well, and so we are not well, whether we want to admit it or not. Many churches feel like they're in exile. Things don't look the way they used to look. Pews aren't as full as they used to be. And so we have a couple of choices. We can engage in toxic positivity. We can say, there's no need to worry. Things are going to go back to the way that they were. We don't need to face the problem or feel any of the grief that's coming with these changes to the way that we practice our religion. Or we could embrace some tragic optimism. Yes, there are things we miss. And yes, there are people we miss. And yes, there are things that it really hurts to change. But this time matters, my friends, and there's so much meaning to be found in it. There is so much ministry to engage in right now. There is so much that we can do for the welfare of our city. So the question is, how will you seek that welfare? How will you serve? How will you find the meaning of this time, even if it feels impossible and unacceptable to do so? Maybe God is telling you to get to know some new people, to build a connection with someone that you wouldn't otherwise. Maybe God is challenging you to a wider understanding of who she is and who she is for. Maybe God is asking you to lead or to mentor, or to encourage and support a new generation of leaders. Maybe God is challenging you to take a minute and to ask for help, even when that's really hard to do. Next week, we are putting our new ministry model into action. We're reorienting our church life around five ministries, stewardship, worship, justice, community, and youth and children. Where might you align your own gifts and passions with one of those and seek the welfare of the people around you, the people of this neighborhood, and the welfare of our larger city? Jeremiah reminds us that this time matters. This time matters because the future of the people, the future of this church, the future of our city, and without being hyperbolic, truly the future of our society, it matters and it depends upon the acceptance of current circumstances. The future, to build a future, depends upon our accepting current circumstances. It depends upon us finding and holding hope right where we are. So build houses. Plant gardens. Cook delicious meals and share them with your friends. Fall in love. Find your family. Build a life like your life depends on it. Because it does. And so does mine. Amen.